finally, we're going to look at production control. So, somebody's got to figure out how to make this, when to make it, how many to make, how to do it. Those are usually based on sales forecasts and things like that. But um, as an example, we might make um, 500 of these in one big run and then put them on the shelf and use them up over a month or two weeks. And so somebody has to plan all that. Can't, it doesn't just happen. And those are production control personnel. Sometimes they're managers, technicians, things like that. And uh, there, are, there are steps that just about every company uses. The smallest, smallest companies even do this, but sometimes they do it very informally. They just, you know, yell across the hall. Hey, I need 50 of these things. Um, but usually to be effective and efficient, you want to have just enough material on your site. You don't want to buy a ton of material that you're not going to use for a long time because you've used up all your money. Um, and so production control is about trying to do the best job to have enough materials to produce what needs to be sold in time to sell it and at a reasonable price. So they're, they're key to it. So how do we do this? In this case, we're going to pretend that we're doing production control for this check assembly that looks like this. And so we have to make a clapper, we have to make a seat ring, and we have to purchase O-rings. And then somebody would put them all together. But we're just going to do, how do I make this thing? How do I make this thing? How do I make this thing? Well, there's three different kind of documents that are used in that production control. One is a bill of materials or a list of materials. Let's take a look at some of these. Um, here we go, get it set up. So there's a bill of materials or a list of materials that tells you what it's made out of. And then there's a purchase order because once you know what the item is made out of, you have to buy the stuff, whether it be raw materials or raw stock or the part itself or uh, as we see in both the clapper and the seat ring, a blank, a intermediate part. So somebody's got to buy some stuff and then somebody's got to kind of organize the, the building of it. Um, if you just work on somebody's memory, it doesn't work very well, especially if that person is absent for, you know, being sick or a family emergency or a holiday or they quit. So it's usually written down, and um, this is very dependent on how much kind of standard documentation the company has and how much they don't and how much they want to rely on the, um, the skills of their workers. But we're going to practice, you know, first do this, then do this, then do this, then do this, and, and we'll see how that goes. Okay, so let's take a look and, and, and we'll do those in lab. We'll, we'll create these for the clapper. Okay, but I'm going to give you a little bit of an example now without doing the whole thing up. There's, a, there's an area that talks about, this is for a bill of materials, an area that talks about what the product is, where it's used, and what revision we're talking about. We'll get into revisions later on, but we, we have to be, everybody's got to be in tune. We have to be making the most current thing uh, available unless we know we want to make it like an old one. And then there are some things called different levels. So we know that we're going to end up with, as an example, a clapper, four inch, machined and it's got a part number i think it was c4 we can go back and check it c4 dash machined something like that and 
I'm going to make one each of those. So every time I make one of these, I need to make that one. And here's where my drawing goes. And I'd usually put a link. Now the next level is what, what is that one made from? That's made from a clapper. Four inch. Um, um, and I'll just call it the blank. Vulcan, I think we called it vulcanized part. And that one had a part number, C4 dash V, oops, C4 dash VP. And each one of these machined ones takes up one each of those. And that one I'm going to purchase. And then I can also put in here that it's made from uh, Norrell GTX. We don't have a stock control for that. And it was 1.5 pound. Oops. 1.5 pound. And I don't have to say they are going to purchase it. And it's also made from EPDM. And I think that was 0.1 pound. We'll go back and look it all up. Now, the more you really want to have control of your processes, the more specs and drawings you would put in here. So this might have, uh, sometimes a machine drawing just has its own drawing, but sometimes there's inspection drawings and packaging drawings and things like that. The vulcanized part might have one drawing or two drawing. The Norrell GTX, I would probably put a link to the spec there. And same for the EPDM. And this would be 1.1.2. So there, that's that would be a bill of materials for the clapper. And I would do a very similar thing for the bill of materials for the seat ring. I always start with the, the main thing I'm making and then just start stepping through. What's that made from? And what's that made from? And we just document it out over here. Okay. So that's how, that's how a bill of materials works. And if these get used in something, I can just copy all that and put it into whatever the bill of materials for what it gets used for. So each discrete part that I end up with gets a bill of materials. So now I need to purchase something here. I need to purchase this vulcanized part. So let's just see. I would have a vendor. So it would be my injection mold ink, whoever is doing that. And there's usually a contact there that you can go to. And there's some notes and there's usually what's called a certified vendor number, which means that um, uh, we know they're a good vendor. We know we get good parts. And if they're certified, we know that they're going to give us um, um, all the material certs and things like that. There'll be a purchase order number. We have to keep track of what we ordered. And somebody in our company is authorized to buy things because <laughs> you know they're promising to spend money so not just anybody can do one of these things and then there's terms when are we going to pay are we going to be pay right when we make the order are we going to pay um, um when they've made it before they shipped 
Are we going to pay after they've shipped and we've accepted them? Are we going to pay once every six months and just count stuff up and give them a huge check? Uh, so these terms are agreed upon between our vendor, the people that are working for us and us, and then where do we want them to ship to? Sometimes they, you know, they go right to our factory. Sometimes they go to a distributor. Sometimes they go might go to a different vendor. We might have one person do the injection molding and another person do the um, EPDM vulcanizing. And then how does it get shipped? So these are all things that are agreed upon. And they're usually pre-filled out and it's very quick and it's very simple. But those are all important items you know if you're going to buy something you got to know who you're buying from and they have to know who they're selling to sometimes there's special marking instructions maybe we have to have them mark each piece or mark the barrel or mark the big box with a po number uh, a part number um maybe a, a certification number. So if there's some way that we want these people, our vendor, to mark our shipment or our product, we would write it down here. So these are all typical things that you see in a purchase order. And then there are, there's what is it we're going to do. So item one would be the clapper, or inch vulcanized part. And the vendor might have their own part number for that. They might go, now we're not using your part number, we're using our own. So maybe they call theirs a one, two, three, four. And ours was clapper four dash VP. That way we know we're all knowing what we're talking about. Now I have to figure out how many I want. Okay, and that's up to production control. They look and go, okay, let's see. It's going to take them three weeks to make an order. In three weeks, I'm going to sell 500 of them. So maybe I'll get 750 just to be safe. Or maybe they go, ah, yeah, you know, they're really fast. I can just get 50 of them. Okay. Um, I'm just, let's just put, I'm going to put down uh, 500 each. And then there's some agreed upon cost between us. Okay. And, and so hopefully that's a good, these, believe it or not, these, uh, this was 10 years ago. Uh, they cost about $9 and 45 cents. Not very much. It was a really good deal. And the extended cost is how much is my whole order for this? So it equals my cost for each one times how many I'm going to buy. There we go. You know, they're going to have nice order. Taxable. You don't really have to worry about this. But if this is a final sale, it's taxable. If I'm going to use this part and do something with it, and make a more expensive part out of it, taxable is no. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this part, and I'm going to do stuff to it, which will make it, in the end, more expensive. And then there's usually an ex a promised ship date or a promised uh, um, receiving date. Uh, so that goes in there. Okay, and then it all adds up, and it gets approved. And that's a typical purchase order. So there is a person in most companies that takes charge of this. They read bills of materials, they look at orders, and they make sure that we have enough material. So we would need from the injection mold company, the clapper. Now, if it's the same company, I might order seat rings. Seat ring. Four inch. Blank. 
And they might have a different one, two, three, five. And we know that this is um, SR4 dash injection mold. That's our part number. Now, it turns out there are two clappers in every valve and only half that number of seat rings. Oh, this is also second check. And this was um, first and second. So we need twice as many of these. So I'm only going to order 250 of those. I'd probably need to order up my first check, but we're not doing that one. Those ones were a little more expensive, believe it or not. Those were about $12. So my grand total, of course, Add it up. I don't know why that that's really weird. There we go. Where there's a will, there's a way. There we go. And somebody would approve it. So now we've figured out what we need to make and all the different things that are part of what we're going to make. We figured out how to purchase all of those things. We would also need our O-ring, but we wouldn't get that from this guy. We would, we would probably have to get that from somebody else. Now we have to figure out how to make them. Okay, and we'll talk about this in lab a lot. So I'm not going to go into great detail in it right now. But again, there's something about what the part is, when we need it, and when it got done, and what revision we're making. And then this is just sort of to help people figure out how many do we need? And then how many am I going to make my work order for? So to think that I'm going to make 500 parts without any mistakes, scrap or rework, you'd have to have a lot of uh, background and experience to know that that would be the case. Usually, you cut the work order for some portion more than are required so that, you know, you, you have a little room. You go, oh, I needed 200 and I made the order for 200, but one of them got smashed by the forklift and I only have 199. Well, that would be a problem. Then I'd have to go through all this process to make one more. So usually you have an amount that you know you want to, to, to use. You make the work order for something a little bit more. And then you figure out how many are completed. That's how you get a track record for how well you do. It's part of your efficiency in production. And so this number, this number on the work order and completed are really, really important. And in some places, you might complete all of them, but inspection might accept or reject a portion of that amount. So this is all about quality control. And those lead to a percent productivity number. And usually the person who's in charge or held accountable for productivity is the, the, the shop lead. That could be a, a four person, a foreman. It could be a manager. It could be um, anybody, whoever is the shop lead for this work order. Who is accountable for this? Because many companies watch who makes what and how well they do and what their quality is like. And um, it, gets, it gets tracked on a work order. Easiest place to track it.
So this is all about planning. Sorry. This is about planning. Planning and quality. And then this is about what's going to, what you're going to do. <laughs> and you can go get stock. You can set up your machine. You can run your machine. You can clean a part. You can inspect a part. And you can return it to stock. So, for instance, if we were making the clapper, the first thing I'd do is pull stock, and that would be get um, uh, clapper four dash I M. And then there's some amount of time that you assign to it. And this is where we look. This is even more, but we're not going to worry about this. This is where whoever is doing it has to record so that when we get this final accept and reject, we might find that there's one step that's causing all the problems. And then we can go work on making that step more effective and more efficient. So once we've done that, we have to do a machine setup, which is freeze part. Remember that? Remember that we had to freeze the part? Set up the fixture. And then we're going to machine the part, which was, in this case, it was grind feature R print. And so on and so forth. So you just start saying what you're doing all the way along and give it some sort of a description. We're not going to worry about the hours. That's what a production manager or a production engineer does. And this part is all about uh, the, the person who's running, the shop lead, is going to fill this out. And if there are specific inspection requirements, we put them in. And here's where we put the reference drawing file. So that's how you do a work order. Every company has their own work order template, their own system. Some of them are far less um, fancy than this. Some are even more fancy than this. Some are just in time, run by computers and all this kind of stuff. This is just a good way to be able to see what's going on. So again, for our production control, we have a bill of materials that tells us what the parts are and how many they, there are and the materials. There's a purchase order that allows us to purchase the materials. And there's a work order that tells the shop floor exactly what to do and tracks our productivity. So we're going to go ahead and fill these out during lab. We'll have some videos on how to do that too. But that will happen in lab and that is your production control.